So as we, uh, as we wrap up the series that we've been in over the last uh, m- a little bit more than eight weeks, I'd like to ask you one question, and it's the, it's the most important question of your life. Now, uh, for those of you who may be coming here for the first time and you've not been part of this series, or those of you who are watching online, I know that at times like this, it can feel like you're coming in at the end of a movie and you don't, you don't know the story, you don't know what's happened. So I would encourage you to go back and listen so you have the full context for where we're going today because we've been in a series called Jesus, Man, Myth, or More. And my hope for this series is for those of you who... Um, who maybe have been unsure about faith, maybe you've been, you know, uh, invited by a friend or you, your wife has been talking with you about this for a long time, maybe you've been interested, maybe you've not been interested, that I hope in this series it's just you've been able to make an informed decision about Jesus. Because we don't, we don't believe in Jesus. It's not it's like just wishful thinking. It's not what helps our kids sleep well at night. Believe it because it's true. And we have reliable evidence that backs why we believe what we believe. And my hope is that you've been able to make an informed decision. And for those of you who have already made a decision, and maybe you grew up in church, maybe you've just always believed, you know, my hope is that you've been able to have um, some words to be able to articulate your faith and why you believe what you believe to your friends, your family, to coworkers, to neighbors, people um, who may be curious as well. So here's the question. Are you ready for it? The most important question of your life. Do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? We've talked about that in this series. Do you believe that he died for your sins? Do you believe that he was resurrected, that his crucified body, which hung on a cross, was later taken down, embalmed, and laid in a tomb? That it was resurrected to new life. And do you believe that he is the Lord, the King of all? If the answer is yes, repent. 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 For the kingdom of heaven is near. You see, repentance is amazing. It's, it's a gift that's given to us by God that allows us to take a step into the kingdom, to begin to experience peace, like peace deep in our soul that we have been forgiven of our sin. We don't have to carry the shame, the guilt of our sin anymore. It allows us to have joy even in the day-to-day stresses of life and in the worries of life. You can actually have joy Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is Jesus' main message. And my hope in this series is that you've been able to make an informed decision about Jesus and that you do believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for your sins, that he was resurrected, and that he is the king over all. But for those of you who who may not be ready to believe that, And maybe you have some questions that maybe I didn't answer in this series. I just want to extend an invitation to you right now to continue learning, to continue talking about. I would love to be able to talk with you about it. Our elders would love to be able to talk with you. Our staff would love to continue to study with you because when Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near, there was a whole lot at stake. He wasn't just saying, hey, repent or, or you won't have as good of life as you could have. Repent or or you won't get the job that you want. Repent or you won't have the marriage that you wanted. That's not what he's saying. He didn't say repent or or you won't make as much money. Repent or or, or you'll... That's not what he's saying. He says repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. There's so much at stake. He, he, He tells others, he says, if you do not repent, you will perish. All who do not repent will perish. Your very soul is at stake And so I pray that you will continue to learn and you'll continue to understand until you're ready to believe. But for all who are ready to take that next step, we're talking about repentance today. And and repentance, it's kind of a, it's kind of an interesting word, isn't it? It's like, it's kind of a Bible-y word, you know, it's a churchy word. You really only use it in this context, you know, you don't really see it in the Wall Street Journal, you don't see it on the news, you know, you don't read about it. It, it, repent, like what does it mean really to repent? It literally means to turn. It, it, it means you're going this way and then you see that the king is here, that he is the one who's in, uh, in authority, that he's the one that has everything that you really want. 
and you turn from going this direction and you turn and you start going in the direction of the king. That, that's what repentance means. And I'll just tell you from, from my experience, and I grew up in church, I was fortunate enough to grow up in church, fortunate enough to grow up into you know, a Christian family that would talk about th- these kinds of things. And, and, and what I learned when I put my faith in Jesus and, and I turned to be able to follow him, it wasn't just a one-time turn and then I had it all figured out, right? And, and those of you who, who have followed Jesus a long time, you know that it, it's a turning and it's a following and then, then you kind of get distracted by something over here. You know, you, you want a little something, oh, I want to explore this over here, and, and yet you still want him, and, and so it, it, you kind of play this game, you know, and repentance is a constant, it's a disciplined process of turning in the direction of the king. What does it mean? It, it literally means stop sinning, right? And, that, and that's the whole point today, okay? So just stop sinning, okay, and just knock it off, all right? You know, that's why I kind of like tell my kids, you know, come in, just knock it off, right? But it's not, it's not that easy, is it? I mean, Jesus, Jesus actually, in a conversation, Christine, you know, read for us just a minute ago, he's talking with some of the religious leaders, and, and they're, they're confused about it, and he's talking to them about their sin, and, and they're like, what are you talking, you know, he, and he, this is what he says, and this is so important that you understand sin in this way. He says, Very truly, I tell you that everyone who sins is a slave to sin. You're a slave to it. It is your master. It is your oppressor. It has control over you. You know, we we, we sometimes we we try to, you know, exert our our will over. I'm not going to sin anymore. I'm not going to do it. And man, I've tried this so many times. I'm just going to go and tell you it doesn't work. Because for me, you know, I, I would find myself and I would have sinned, and I'd be like, oh, come on, man, don't do that anymore. And I might last a little while, you know. I might last a few days, or maybe if I was lucky, a week. But oftentimes I'd find myself right back in it, and I'd be like, oh, man, stop it, quit, knock it off. Don't do that anymore. You know, and I'd make all these commitments, and then I would totally let myself down again. Why? Because everyone who sins is a slave to sin. It's an addiction. And if you know how an addiction works, you require more and more of the substance <laughs> to get less and less of the high. Sin works in the same way. You you, you need a little bit more of it. You need a little bit more of it. And and the next thing you know, it it totally has mastery over you. It totally has, you know, domination over you. But that all who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for your sins, that he was resurrected, that he is king overall, if you totally believe that, you just, like, uh, yes, I'm going to accept it. I'm going to hang everything on that repentance is a gift. And, and it's, not, it's not you exerting your will over the sin to stop the sin. It is the spirit of the creator coming into you and it's Christ's power in you that allows you to break free from that. So I really want to talk, you know, both to those of you who are ready to make an informed decision about Jesus, that you do believe, that you are ready to, you see why the resurrection is worth believing and you see that if the resurrection is true then you accept his claims and who he is. But I also want to talk to those of you who've been in church for a long time. It may be you, like me, need to fully repent. You need to go through the process. We're talking about the process and, and I almost hesitate to use the word process because what I'm about to share with you are not, <clears throat> they're not steps of repentance. It's not like First, take step number one, okay? And take number step, okay, now let's take step number It's not that. It's not stages. It's just they're essentials to what repentance is of the gift that's been given to you. So that if you've ever gotten stuck in maybe some old sins, though you have believed in the king, if you've ever gotten stuck, it may, maybe you're missing one of the essential parts. Or maybe you've forgotten one of the essential parts to forgiveness. Are you with me? So here's what I want to do. I want to share four essentials to repentance. And I'll tell you up front, I'm going to spend a disproportionate amount of time on the first point. And each of the following points will get shorter as we go. I just want to give you a heads up, okay? Four essentials for all who want to experience deep and lasting change in your life to be free from sin. Here we go. First one. See your sin. 
like really see your sin. See sin is not, it's not just um, breaking a rule. See sin is not just making a mistake. But see sin for what it really is. It, it is that the way that you're operating, y- you are misaligned with how you were designed. God designed you in a certain way. He designed you to, to spread goodness into the world. Uh, we understand it in the context of, of Genesis 1 and 2 that we were created to take the goodness of the garden out into the world and bring all of the potential that God has packed in it, to bring all of the potential goodness out of it into the world to create neighborhoods and communities and people working together. But that he gave us a choice and that when sin entered the world, we became misaligned with how we were designed. You know, to, to understand that our conscience is corrupted. You know, our conscience, kind of like the Jiminy Cricket on, on your shoulder, let your conscience be your guide. Understanding, seeing your sin is understanding that your conscience is actually not that reliable because you've been misaligned. The Apostle Paul knew this. And the Apostle Paul only was called the Apostle Paul because he repented, he turned. He, he hated Christians. He hated Jesus followers. He hated Jesus. He tried to put an end to the whole thing, and then he met Jesus, resurrected. He totally turned and started following him. And he's writing, uh, he's writing about our, our faulty consciences to um, the church in Corinth. And he says this, and, and you know, Paul, he, he didn't have skeletons in his closet. They were all out. Everybody knew about them. In fact, the church in Corinth was like, are we really supposed to listen to this guy? We know what he's done. We know, you know, he, he, he beat my brother. You know, he put my uncle in jail. He, he drove him out of business. We live here now because Paul, Saul, had driven them out. And, and so they're questioning, are we really supposed to listen to this guy? And here's what Paul says. It's so important. He says, I care very little if I'm judged by you or any human court. Now, if you read this in context, this isn't a statement of arrogance. It's an explanation. Listen, I I understand how you you might feel about me, but but I don't don't really care if I'm judged by you or any human court. I'll tell you, I don't even judge myself. And they're going, "What, what do you mean, Paul? He says, listen, my conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. That is huge. That means that you, you can be going to sleep at night thinking that was a great day, everything was just fine. Everything's going just fine as long as everything's performing well. Like, I feel really good. But what he's saying is, is you can still be guilty. Just because your conscience is clear doesn't mean that you're not sinning. He goes on, he says, it is the Lord who judges me. He is the standard. Okay, let, let, me, let me give you an example. Let's go with this conscience, faulty conscience idea a little bit longer. So this has happened to me a couple of times, but the first time I just remember it, and I'll just be honest with you, I kind of lost it. Okay, here's what happened. My wife and I moved to uh, Nashville. We got to our first apartment, and one night in the middle of the night, the smoke detector starts going off in our apartment. I get up, and I'm like, oh, what's going on? I'm like looking for smoke, and there's no smoke. I'm like looking out the window. There's no fire. I'm frustrated. I go p- push the little test button, you know, reset the whole thing, go back to bed. Well, it happens again. Same thing. Now I'm really frustrated. I press it. It happens again a third time. This time, I just rip that thing from the wall. Like, like done with that, it starts chirping. <laughs> I open it up. I take the batteries out. I kid you not. It keeps chirping. I'm not going to tell you what my attitude was like at this point, but it was about as bad as you can imagine, okay? I took that thing. I opened up the linen closet. I pulled up the stack of towels. I put in the towels, crammed it down, slammed the door, went back to bed, and, of course, I could still hear it, you know? And the rest of the night I heard that. See, your conscience is is kind of like a, a smoke detector, a faulty smoke detector. Sometimes it's set off just by little particles in the air, just little dust in the air. It just totally goes off. And then we know that homes and apartment buildings burn every single year because one didn't go off. And they weren't able to catch it in time. And, and so your conscience, if you're relying on that to tell you what, what is sin and what is not sin, you're putting yourself in danger. You see, seeing your sin 
is to recalibrate your conscience to the designer's standards, not your own standards. You know, in, in this world, you know, we kind of say, you do you, and you, you know, you do you. And, and that's basically saying, you know, let your conscience be your guide. It's not. Seeing your sin is to recalibrate your conscience to the designer's standards, not your own. Now, this is so important. I want to go a little bit further with it, okay? So hang with me. Do you ever read the Bible? For those of you who read the Bible, you've been in church for a while, do you ever read the Bible and read stories about sin in the Bible and then look at the punishment for that sin and think, well, that was a little bit much. You ever think about that? I, I, I do. I referenced, <clears throat> I referenced one of these stories last week. In Genesis 19, uh, God is coming to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because they had become like, almost like a stage four cancer. They're, they're about, it's about to spread into his world. And like a skilled surgeon, surgeon he's going to come and he's going to cut that cancer out so it doesn't spread to the rest of the body, right? And, and yet, um, <clears throat> Abraham's nephew Lot and his wife and family, they lived there and God permitted them to escape before the destruction. And, and so the, the angel of the Lord co- comes down and he is he's sharing the news. This is what's about to happen. It's going to be destroyed, but you're, you're permitted to leave. You know, just one, one instruction. Don't look back. Don't look back. And of course, like I referenced last week, they're fleeing the cities and Lot's wife looks back and she's turned into a pillar of salt. Like immediately turned into a pillar of salt. The angel wasn't like, hey, hey, remember what I said, you know. There was no, hey, listen, I'm going to count to three, right? (laughs) Don't look back. There was none of that. It was immediate, immediate death. I just read that and I go like, oh man, I just kind of seems like a lot. But fast forward to Numbers 15, God has set up a covenant with his people, right? And and then they broke the covenant. And then he reinstates the covenant and they're building the tabernacle and like things are kind of back on track. And then they find this this man who was out on the Sabbath and he he was picking up sticks, like probably to have a little fire. And they're like, I don't know. It's the Sabbath. I'm not sure we're supposed to do that. So they bring him in. They're like, what are we supposed to do with him? And what's, what's the instruction if you know the story? Take him outside the camp and stone him. And that's what they did. Second Samuel chapter 6. The Ark of the Covenant. David's bringing it back to Jerusalem. They're going to like set up camp. This is going to be the capital. This is like, you know, this is exciting. Da- this is like David dancing before the Ark of the Covenant as it comes in. It's a really big deal. And on its way in, it starts to tip. Uzzah reaches out and, and he like kind of rightens it a little bit. Struck dead immediately. You know, and I'm kind of like, what? Well, you know, he's helping it from falling over. You know, wouldn't it? Don't you get a little bit of, no, struck dead immediately. Now, I, I know what some of you might be thinking. Well, that's an Old Testament thing, you know? That's an Old Covenant thing. It's not that way anymore. It's different. Well, what about Acts chapter 5, you know? The Jesus movement is off to a start. They're throwing this big capital campaign to be able to f- feed the poor, you know? And people are selling properties, and they're selling their, their assets, and they're coming, they're laying their, their, their money at the disciples' feet. And Ananias and Sapphira, they sell a piece of property, and they bring most of it in. And Peter asks Ananias, he says, hey, is this, you know, is this all, all the money from the sale of your property? And Ananias and Sapphira, they'd already talked about it. We're going to keep some back. Now, I don't think that Peter is saying that you had to give it all. I think he's asking a point blank question. Is this all? And Ananias wants the honor of both supporting the church and he wants to keep a little bit back for himself. Struck dead. Sapphira, she doesn't know what's going on. She's somewhere else. He come, comes back. She doesn't know what's happened. She's questioned again, same response, struck dead. Do do you see what I mean? Like some of the stories about sin and punishment seem like a little bit much. You know, and I kind of ask myself like, well, does the punishment match the crime? But here's where we learn something in, in these stories is that punishment for sin is not just about the severity of sin, but also about the one sinned against like, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say this. When I was a kid, and I was just kind of like out, it wasn't all the time, but it was often, and I would just like see an ant, you know, or some other bug, I would go out of my way to stomp on it, okay? 
Now, that's, uh, that's not a good thing to do. Why would you do that? If you're a kid who's doing that, knock it off, okay? But then my cousins, they had this other thing that they would do, and I, it's, this is awful. It's re- really terrible. They, they had a little ravine in their backyard, a little creek that ran through it, and they would climb up 8 to 10 feet on a platform with a, a big rock, and they would look for frogs and, and would lift that to drop. Isn't that awful? That's, it's awful. Now think about it. You sin against an ant, you step on it. I mean, you're not that guilty. You throw a rock on a frog? <laughs> like, you're more guilty. We're supposed to care for the animals, right? Okay, th- think about it a little bit more, okay? Uh, you slap a man in the face, you know? Like, in the parking lot, and you're leaving today, right? You walk out there, you slap a man in the face, and everyone's going to be like, oh, what's the deal with that? Hey, come on, calm down, everything. Okay, everybody back up, everything's fine, Right? When you walk into the White House and you slap the president in the face, what's going to happen? You're going to jail, right? It's not just about the severity of sin, but the one sinned against. And imagine if you sin against an infinite God who created you, are infinitely guilty. Do you you see that? Like, let's, let's make this a little bit more personal. All you wives out there, you know, if you, if you lie to your husband, like, even just a little lie, right? Just a little white lie. He'll never know about it. He doesn't even know where I got these shirts from anyway, right? <laughs> if you lie to your wife, I mean, you, you, excuse me, you lie to your husband, do you see how you are really, you're dehumanizing a son of God as one who's not worthy of the truth, you know, and, and all you husbands out there, you know, if you lust after another woman who is not your wife, do you see how you objectify a daughter of God? Do you see that? Those of you in, in middle school or high school, co- college age, if you disrespect your parents, do, do you see how you're essentially calling the creator of heaven and earth, a fool for giving you those parents to have authority in your life. That's, that's the whole part of this first part of repentance. Seeing your sin is seeing your sin as God sees your sin. This is the first essential to repentance. Let's look at the second one. The second is not just to see your sin as God sees your sin, but to grieve your sin, to grieve it, to mourn over it. Okay, in in seeing your sin, it's more of an intellectual uh, exercise. It's more of understanding. It's being able to read the scripture and understand the, the, the standard at which we are being judged against. But to grieve your sin is actually an emotional response. It's moving from your mind down into your heart. And what I'm not talking about what I'm not talking about, what I have done myself before, is self-pity. You know? You just, you just self-pity yourself all, all, all the time. You're like, oh, man. I, you know, I, I never get it right. Right? I just, oh, just never get it right. That's not grieving your sin. That's, that's starting to punish yourself for your sin. Oh, just awful. Or, or to say, you know, I'm just a bad person. I'm the worst. Like, here I am again. I'm doing this again. It's awful. It's awful. That's not grieving your sin. You're, you're trying to punish yourself for your sin. I'm also not talking about grieving the embarrassment of your sin. Oh no, they found out that, that I've done that. My, my parents caught me. My, my wife caught me. My husband caught me. My, 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 my boss caught me, whatever. And, and oh, this is so embarrassing. I can never see them again. I can never go out again. I can never. That's not grieving your sin. That's grieving the embarrassment of your sin. In the same way, I'm not talking about grieving the consequences of your sin. So a few years ago, there was another church. There was um, a, um, a couple in our class, about the same age, husband, wife. They got a couple kids. And, and you probably already know a story like this one, okay? Husband has an affair. He goes off with the mistress, right? The, the wife, she's still in our church. She, she's devastated. She's just got you know, a couple kids, and we're all like rallying around here trying to support her, 
you know, well, after a little while, the, the guy ends up, you know, realizing he's not, you know, spending enough time with his kids, not seeing them as much, and, and he gets kind of bored with her, you know. So he comes back, and he's like, I'm sorry, you know. I, I shouldn't have done it, you know. It, it, was, it was a mistake. I, I'm, really, I'm really sorry. And, and she takes him back, you know, and it seems like, okay, well, maybe there's, maybe there's hope for this. Maybe they're, they're going to they're gonna be together, you know, after all, and happy family, that's great. A little time goes by. He gets bored with her. So he goes back to her, right? And, and, this, and it becomes a cycle. He starts it over again. A little bit of time passes. Well, he wants to come back. Do you see he's not grieving his sin? He's grieving the consequences of his sin. Oh, I just miss my family and I miss you. And, and maybe he's embarrassed, you know, that, you know, now people at his work, they know about it. They know that his personal life's a mess and, and they're not really sure that they want to continue to partner with him or, or to do business with him. He's not grieving his sin. He's grieving the consequences of his sin. Do you see that? Seeing your sin as God sees your sin is the first essential to repentance. But grieving your sin means that you feel remorse for the wickedness of your sin, not just the consequences of it. That's so important. To be able to see your sin as dishonoring God, as dishonoring people who've been created in his image. The third essential to repentance, this gift that we have been given that brings about change is to admit your sin. This is when the intellectual part of seeing your sin as God sees your sin and the emotional part of grieving your sin come together and, and, and you take responsibility for your sin. King David in, in Psalm 32, he, you know, David, he's, he's a great man and yet we know some of his sins they're they're, they're big they're public they're they're devastating they, they totally wreck his kingdom wreck his family you know there's in, in fighting of, of family members even his own sons after him like so so i'm not exactly sure which of those mistakes this is from but you can see that david he's kind of been holding on to it. like he sees his sin he sees what's wrong with it he's grieving his sin and yet he's he's holding it and he explains, he says, when I kept silent, when I didn't talk about it, when I didn't speak it, when I didn't own it, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand is talking to God. Your hand was heavy on me and my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. But then, then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. See, we have a tendency, I have a tendency, it comes to my sin, to kind of shift some of the blame, you know? And, and you may say, you know, oh goodness, you know, I, I know I shouldn't have said that to my mom, but if you had my mom, Right? I, I know I know I shouldn't have done that, but if you knew the kind of stress that I was under, I, I, I know I shouldn't, but, but, and you kind of rationalize a little bit of it away. Like, you, you kind of own it. You, you kind of say, yeah, yeah, I, I, I shouldn't have done it, but in all, all things considered, if you're under the circumstances, you know, but see, that's not what admitting your sin is. That, that's not part of repentance. Re- repentance is to say, I did it. It was all me to fully own it, to see your sin as God sees your sin, to grieve your sin, the wickedness of it, and to admit it fully, it was always me. Admitting your sin is taking personal responsibility for it without blame shifting any of it. Those are the first three essential. And all of these can happen simultaneously, but if the next part doesn't happen, if this next essential doesn't happen, you will not experience deep and lasting change. You, you will continue to be distracted by the world. You will find yourself stuck in old sins. You, you will fall back into it. It will continue to have mastery over you. See your sin, grieve your sin, admit your sin, and then hate your sin. To hate your sin, to be able to look upon the cross of Jesus Christ and, and see him bloody and to see his face, bruises on it 
from the chief priests and the elders hitting him to see his back that has been ripped a flog, a crown of thorns pressed down, blood is dripping into his eyes. He's got nails in his hands and his feet. He, he, he's struggling for every breath. If you see that, and then you, you look at your sin, what you might be tempted to fall back into, and you, and you might tempted to be, want a little bit more of it, you say, how, when this has been done for me, when Jesus was willing to die for me, if you had been the only person who had ever lived that he would have come down and done the same thing for you, to see that what he's done for you, say, how can I go on sinning? How can I go on sinning? Because when you take personal responsibility for it and you look upon the cross of Jesus, you see and you can begin to hate your sin, realizing fully that Jesus has taken full responsibility for it. When you admit it and you own it and then you see that he owned it, that's where the change happens. That's where chains start to break. That's where freedom starts to happen. If you want deep and lasting change in your life, if you want change that lasts, you have to repent first. And I hope that you can see that repentance, you can't hack repentance. It's it's an all-in thing. It's a disciplined process of seeing your sin as God sees your sin, of grieving your sin, of admitting your sin, and of hating your sin because of what has been done for you. And for those of you who I just, I pray for, those of you who maybe come into this series and, and you've had questions about Jesus and I hope they've been answered. And maybe you're ready to, to take a step. You see, repentance, it's a gift and, and it's given with a very tangible, a, a, a very tangible, a very real action associated with it. It's it's called baptism. It's being able to go down into the water and totally die to yourself because you look back on this side and you see that you, you are dead on this side. There is no hope but to go down and die with Jesus and to come up on the other side free, reborn, a new creation This is what I I want for you. I I want you to experience that peace and that that cleanness that comes. You know, for for those of you, you've already been baptized. Those of you who who have already died to yourself. We're given another gift. It's the gift of the Lord's Supper, the gift of communion that we just took a minute ago. We, We take his body, we take his blood, and we say, how, how can I go on sinning? when he has done this for me. And that is when the power of Christ begins to work in you. My, my prayer, my prayer for, for those of you who may be ready to make a decision to put Jesus on, to fully trust in him, my prayer is that, is that you will accept this gift of repentance and, and that you will get baptized. We, we can do it today. You can respond either while we sing, you can come and talk to me afterwards, or we can continue to study. But my prayer is that you believe Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for your sins, and all of the evil of your life passes to him, and all of his goodness passes to you. We have hope in his resurrection. He is the king. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we look back on uh, these, these last several weeks of <clears throat> examining why we believe what we believe is worth believing in, I just want to thank you for laying out the breadcrumbs that we can follow, that we can trust, that we can rely on the evidence that has been put out before us, that the resurrection is true that your crucified body was raised to life and then ascended into heaven as you sat down at the right hand of God and that we have hope of a new heavens and a new earth when we, when we put our trust in you. And Father, I just I want to pray specifically for those who, who may be on the fence about this. I pray that your truth, your, your 
your word will transcend mine, that mine will be forgotten, that yours will be remembered, that it will sink deep into the hearts and we'll see this gift of repentance, see the gift of being aligned with your design, of, of the gift of the Spirit coming in and directing us. And Father, that they can experience the freedom and the peace and the rest that comes with choosing to follow Jesus. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing.